In the south of Chile, there is a place like no other, the ultimate symbol of the natural world, Patagonia. This environment, with its harsh, hostile climate, is home to abundant and unique wildlife. But that hasn't always been the case. Since the start of the millennium, at the instigation of an atypical couple of billionaires, Christine and Douglas Tompkins, the region has been undergoing a startling transformation. After 14 years of human endeavor on an unprecedented venture, the world's biggest private ecological project has come to fruition. And Shakabuco Valley thrives once again at the heart of one of South America's last great wild landscapes. For over a century, Shakabuco Valley was a typical Chilean ranch. Over the years, more and more fences went up and the herds of cattle kept increasing in size. Meanwhile, wild animals were systematically slaughtered for their meat or their hide, or because of their negative image. As the wild fauna disappeared, overgrazing destroyed the grass and plants. Barely 15 years ago, the area was totally barren, the vegetation giving way to dust. But at the end of the 1990s, the region's luck turned. Douglas and Christine Tompkins, the founders and directors of the North Face and Patagonia brands, took a huge gamble. Guided by their love of Patagonia, where they had been traveling together for years, they chose to give up the business world and turn their attention to the environment. Through their foundation, they acquired hundreds of thousands of hectares of damaged land with one idea in mind, to return it to its natural state through the creation of a national park which would be restored to the public domain. In total, they bought, restored and protected over 850,000 hectares, a surface area the size of Corsica. Despite the tragic death of Douglas in 2015, Christine continues to push on with the project because the creation of Patagonia National Park remains their biggest undertaking to date. Doug discovered it in 1992 and I came here for the first time in 1993 and I began to see that there was something very special about it. It came up for sale, so we decided to go for it in terms of conservation. That's how we got started. This valley was completely overgrazed. It was down to the dirt. The, the work that has to be done to create a national park is a very long list. You have to build a team that is the transition team from ranch to park. You have to manage it as a ranch. You have to start taking fences down. So there's a lot of juxtaposition between the old use for this land, which was the ranch, and the new destiny for the land, which was a, a national park. A lot of people ask us why we acquire these lands, build these, these points of infrastructure, and then we give it all away back to the country. But we have seen that over the long term, the health and welfare of these landscapes and species is better served within the public good than the private. Institutionally, legally, the best shot you have is to create national parks. And we believe that it's a democratic act because these parks belong to everyone. They don't belong to, to certainly to us and to the foundation. But now they, in this case, they belong to all Chileans. The landscape surrounding Shakabuco Valley is incredibly rich straddling Chile and Argentina, and cut in two by the Andes Cordillera. Patagonia is an ecological region like no other.
This national park, created and then handed over to Chile at the start of 2018, is in a unique area of the world where the dry ecosystems characteristic of the Argentinian side meet the rainforests of Chile. Shakabuco Valley provides a transition between these two spectacularly rich ecosystems. It represents a gap in the Cordillera and allows these two worlds, normally separated by insurmountable peaks, to meet. Shakabuco Valley forges a link between the Hainimeni Nature Reserve, which is mainly made up of high mountains, and the Tamongo Nature Reserve, which is more forested. Its strategic geographical position gives continuity to the migration corridors for various species. The reason for that is its fairly unique geology. The region's rugged landscape was largely shaped by water in all its forms. Long ago, an ice cap covered the majority of the region. You can still see traces of it today, scattered here and there. Despite their rigid appearance, glaciers are constantly moving. At the end of the ice age, the ice cap melted, putting yet more pressure on the land. As it receded, parts of the rock were eroded. Shakabuko Valley is one of the indelible scars the ice made on the stone. Traces of the ice's passage can still be seen in these strange rock formations. Wind, rain and snow finished off the erosion of the peaks. As the snow melted, it created rivers, the main one being Rio Shakabuko, which snakes along the valley floor. Sweeping up any remnants of the melting ice cap, it gradually filled the path that had been dug. Numerous rivers and streams meet on the valley floor, forming the lakes and marshes which flood the steppes. Surrounded by drier, wind-battered ground that is ruled by large animals such as guanacos, these wetlands are home to an abundance of wildlife. These areas of exceptional biodiversity play a predominant role in the park's ecosystems. The reeds and rushes are the ideal habitat for a multitude of amphibians and birds. Some of the species which were becoming rare, such as the common snipe or the black-necked swan, are thriving once more. A bit further on, a small lake has a more hostile air about it. If you look closely, no vegetation is growing there. That's because the water is salty. The salt deposits on its bank attract guanacos, which come here to lick the ground. But more importantly, this strange chemistry, which comes from mineral salts contained in the rocks, swept along by the melting ice, has caused a large population of tiny shrimps called gamaros to arise. These attract a creature which is symbolic of this region of the globe, the Chilean flamingo. In between naps in the sunshine, they are busy searching for food. Performing a sort of dance, they filter the little pink crustaceans which give them their characteristic coloring. The extremes of this environment, with its unique fauna, make the park an invaluable wildlife reserve. This unusual biodiversity, combined with the beauty of the landscape, ended up convincing Christine Tompkins that it was essential to fight to protect this place from unreasonable human activity. Christine and Douglas's approach, known as deep ecology, consisted of eradicating any traces left by humans, taking down the numerous fences, pulling up any non-native plants, 
moving the cattle, even limiting access. The aim was to let nature reassert itself and form a haven of peace for the most endangered wild species. Deep ecology is really, it's an idea developed by the Norwegian philosopher Arne Ness that non-human life and human life have an intrinsic value all of their own and that we humans need to recognize and understand that we depend on one another and that we have to behave in a way that all species are capable of flourishing. But that's the underlying value system. I don't know why it doesn't strike everyone. I would ask the reverse question because not to recognize this is the most misguided position of all because you're killing yourself. You're killing your neighbors. So why would we adopt this, this, it's not even a philosophy, it's common sense. The question is, why aren't you adopting it? This work is accompanied by scientific studies, such as the monitoring of populations of puma and waymals, a native deer that is in danger of extinction. The rapid transformation was sometimes met with bitter criticism from locals who were pretty traditional in their thinking. Over time, there's been um, real concern locally. They were concerned about us not killing pumas as the pumas had been systematically uh, reduced over time because of the predator-prey conflict. And they called this the puma factory. More recently, as the grasses have begun to come back because we took the livestock off, there is a kind of disillusionment that these grasslands are improving and the grasslands outside the park aren't necessarily doing so because they're still being grazed. I was born and raised on my great-great-grandfather's ranch in California. I am from a ranching family. I understand the love of the culture surrounding ranching. And I I understand why some people are in a disagreement with this. Some people say, oh, you've taken this ranch out of production. And I always say, no, that's not true. We have changed what it's producing. It's true, most of the world's grasslands have been converted into agricultural land, causing a massive loss of habitat for the wildlife. Restoring these regions is the start of a long process aimed at achieving a balance between the human and natural uses of this type of ecosystem. Despite being vast and mountainous, Patagonia has suffered human exploitation. Shakabuko Valley's grasslands were overgrazed for too long, allowing for a succession of non-native plant species, such as hemlock and milk thistle, to take root. Over 1,000 kilometers of fences lined the valley, breaking up the habitat and blocking important migration corridors. Hundreds of guanaco carcasses hung from the barbed wire from animals that died trying to jump over it. Fortunately, following an appeal by the Tompkins Foundation, volunteers from all over the world joined the cause and started taking down these barriers. The teams whom we have worked with are the reasons that the parks ex exist. Without the teams of people, for example, in this park, there would be no park. One man in particular has been crucial to this activity. As director of conservation, Christian Saucedo manages various teams, whose job it is to keep an eye on the wildlife in the park. He spends his days rebuilding the region's natural environment. He is making one of his regular trips to a post near the border with Argentina. On his initiative, two centers have been created there for reintroducing rheas into the wild. The rhea is the ostrich's South American cousin. Today, he is taking a new volunteer there who will stay there for the next two months. 
That all started in 2014 with the creation of a first parkkeeper station aimed at protecting the rears from predators and any other potential threats. Next, in 2015, we started picking up and rescuing any injured rear orphans we found on the roadside. These rears allowed us to launch our breeding program, but it wasn't enough. We needed more of them and we didn't have much money. So we developed this animal rescue center to increase the population. These initiatives have helped us set up our breeding center and meant that we could start breeding last year. And we'll do so again this year. Since we're operating in a very cold and windy environment, it's hard work. We manage, but it's not easy. It's not really a very easy species to study. What motivated me at the start was the possibility of creating a national park. It was a unique opportunity to envisage the restoration of a complete ecosystem, um, a specifically Patagonian ecosystem, with all the original flora and fauna whose natural habitats had been destroyed over time. It was about giving this land the opportunity to resume its initial evolution which had been halted by the arrival of the settlers with their livestock. What's so special about Chacabuco Valley and the rest of Patagonia National Park is that it's a perfect biodiversity hotspot for the whole of Patagonia. Thanks to the sustained and painstaking work of Christian and his teams, nature was quick to reassert itself on the park's plains and can once again be admired in all its diversity. In the middle of the plain, one plant in particular stands out, the yareta. Despite its moss-like appearance, it is as hard as stone. This extraordinary density helps it to withstand the cold and the wind. With a rate of growth of about one millimeter a year, it takes years for it to reach a decent size. But the yareta has time on its hands because it can live to be 3,000 years old. Now a protected species, it almost disappeared, since in addition to being occasionally used in medicine, it was collected for firewood because of its heat-giving properties, which are similar to those of coal. Our aim is to make sure this virgin ecosystem survives the test of time and all of its species are preserved, but it is also to develop tourism in the region. Thanks to our program, tourists can come and appreciate nature and admire the wildlife, which represents the best of Patagonia and its ecosystem.
This park is one of the few places in the world where it's possible to observe all of the species that are native to Patagonia, such as condors, rias, foxes, guanacos and waymos. The condor is the real icon of all the conservation work being done in Chacabuco Valley. Condors feed off guanaco carcasses that have been abandoned by pumas, thereby perpetuating the age-old interactions that unite these three species. We thought this land had been lost, but today, thanks to the resumption of interactions like this, we're witnessing the renaissance of Chacabuco Valley. Once found all over the Chilean prairies, guanacos became the victims of an unspoken extermination that was similar to that of North American bison. But in Chacabuco Valley, they have made their comeback. And today, there are over 3,000 of them. These wild cousins of the llama now rule these vast, windswept, sun-scorched grasslands once more. Their thick coats help them to withstand the region's harsh climate. They play a key role in the ecosystem. They're what is known as a keystone species. Acting as a regulator, they prevent the proliferation of certain grasses. They act as both disseminators and a source of manure. It is the start of summer, so the young, known as chulengos, are frolicking round their parents, guarded by sentries posted on surrounding peaks to keep a lookout for the slightest hint of danger. The family groups consist of a dominant male with its harem of females. The young are tolerated until they become adolescents, but once they reach a certain age, they are dismissed without further ado. The Chulengos prepare for their future by copying the gestures of their elders. At their age, these games have no real consequences. But the adult males have long, sharp teeth which they have no qualms about using to inflict terrible wounds. The dominant male keeps a constant guard over his territory, fiercely defending it from his competitors. Sometimes, warnings do not suffice, and fighting is inevitable. This old male guanaco has finally died, exhausted from a lifetime of combat. But wherever death strikes, life is never far away. A whole series of scavengers arrives on the scene. The caracaras are the first to come and squabble over the carcass, but soon, they will have to give way, because the world's largest flying bird is hovering in the sky above, the Andean condor. A 
at 1.2 meters tall with a wingspan of 3.5 meters, it easily dominates this small fry. This majestic bird has become very rare. It is an emblem of Chile, a symbol of power and freedom. Its population has declined sharply because of the poison laid out and shots fired by cattle breeders who still believe condors to be responsible for attacks on their herds. But as impressive as they may look, Andean condors are vultures. Their bald heads allow them to dive into carcasses to fish out the entrails. An Andean fox has also got its eye on the prize, but it's going to have to wait its turn. Meanwhile, in the herd of guanacos, life goes on. The dominant male is soon replaced. Igual está tibio ahora. Christian Saucedo is somebody we met before we started this project. He was working with the Wemul deer in Tamango, what used to be uh, a separate national reserve from this park. And when we bought by Chacobuco, we specifically went and looked for him and, and asked him if he would become the director of conservation here. So he really has been at the ground floor and essential for everything that has to do with wildlife. We had this special situation. We had a, a, a species here that's going extinct, the Waymo deer, but we also wanted to bring the puma population back up and the foxes back up. So you have these natural conflicts in, in really keystone species. And Christian is, is, the, is the architect of all of that. So he's really central to, to not only what's happening at this park, but what's happening with these species elsewhere. So yeah, he's an important guy. To support Christian Saucedo in his work, employees from the former Estancia have stayed on, despite the valley's transformation. They have learned to adapt and have retrained as rangers. Now they strive to protect the natural environment that they once battled against. We still have employees who joined the team at the time of the sale. Yeah. The, the people who know this property the best will be the people who've been here the longest and whose jobs took them all over the ranch. So Don Daniel working very specifically in the high population Waymul areas, Don Arcilio who's working with Pumas. Those are people who know this place like the back of their hand. And they have jobs that are somewhat similar but completely sort of turned on their heads and toward different goals can't do this without people who are willing to, to work in very difficult circumstances, to live in really isolated places. So you have to want to do this. If creating national parks were so simple, 
there'd be a lot more people doing it. Not all of the old posts were abandoned. Some of the most remote posts are now used to keep an eye on this vast territory. Arsilio Sepulveda is one of these redeployed gauchos. Once a puma tracker, he is now in charge of watching over the park's population of these impressive wild cats. When the park first opened, he would go off for several days with his hunting dogs to track the pumas and capture them so that they could be fitted with GPS collars. These exhausting and dangerous missions almost always took place in winter in the snow. Riding on horseback, without a path to guide him, and with no means of communication other than a radio that only worked intermittently, Arsilio put his previous expertise to good use for a cause that was totally new to him. I didn't used to take any interest in pumas. I just tracked them and set my dogs on them. That's all. It's different now. I've learned so much since I've been here. I like being in the park. I feel good here. The salary is better and we get our clothes washed and so on. We get all of our clothes provided for us and that didn't used to happen. It was very different. There was none of that. Here they do everything for us. I think there are more pumas now than before because before what used to happen was the majority were tracked. We chased them away. The best case scenario was that we didn't shoot them but we set the dogs on them to chase them away. You would never have seen a puma in the middle of the path here before. Never. For years on end, he rode with a gun. Now, he no longer needs one. He has substituted his weapon for an antenna. This will allow him to locate the pumas that he fitted with collars several years ago. With the return of the grasses and the pulling down of fences, Herds of guanacos soon built up again, providing abundant foodstuff for these super predators. After 14 years of monitoring them, we now know that, thanks to the return of these herbivores, there has been a marked increase in the number of pumas here, and they are once again playing their part in the natural selection of guanacos. By killing those who are sick or weak, they are contributing to the overall good health of the guanaco population in the park. At the end of the day, we're responsible for what you see here. We need to monitor everything and trust our instincts. We need to keep an eye on the guanacos and monitor how many of them are killed by pumas. My boss, Don Christian, has entrusted that job to me. In addition to his antenna, Arsilio uses hidden cameras to monitor the presence of these animals. Thanks to his knowledge of the terrain and the animal's habits, he can record behavior that would be virtually impossible to see with the naked eye. He places his cameras in strategic places and then comes back to collect them several days later.
Back on the plane, life goes on as usual. The remnants of the puma's meal have attracted a strange looking animal. With its supple yet robust carapace, protecting it from predators, the big hairy armadillo is nonchalantly scuttling about in search of food under the watchful eye of other local inhabitants. Armadillo is generally the last to get its hands on the carcasses left by other scavengers. Luckily, it likes very dried out meat. Once it has finished its mouthful, the armadillo scuttles off to explore its territory in search of insects and other larva, which it will unearth with the help of its powerful claws. Higher up, the mountain slopes that are more exposed to rainfall are covered with forests. That's where Daniel Velasquez Romero works. He spends every day in the forest with his son, looking for an extremely rare member of the deer family, the huemu. Even with the help of an antenna, it will take him several hours of walking, despite his vast knowledge of the mountains, to find this forest deer. There are only 40 of them left in the park. In the undergrowth, a kind of lichen that resembles a beard covers the tree trunks and is proof of just how pure the air is in this region. Once used as bandages by indigenous people, it now serves as a refuge for numerous animals and vegetable species. The forest is mainly composed of three native species of beech tree and a wide diversity of vascular plants that are essential to the survival of native wildlife. This exuberant environment makes it the refuge of choice for birds. But as with any place, certain predators have learned to take advantage of that. The Chilean hawk haunts these woods. It's constantly lying in wait. It's just a matter of choosing the right prey. And the right moment. I am a park keeper. I assist with the Huimul project. I came here in 2006. I've devoted the past 12 years to looking after this animal. The aim of the project is to increase the population, but also to study its distribution and way of life.
There used to be huimals everywhere. They were once so numerous, whereas now the species is at serious risk of extinction. There are very few of them left. Even if you're equipped with a detector and an antenna, it's hard to spot them. They're not easy to observe. But since I'm familiar with their habitat, I know how to approach them. It's possible to spend time with them, but in order to do that you have to respect them, give them space and leave them in peace, giving them the chance to move away if they want to. If you do that, you can follow them around all day. I used to work in the park before this. I was a shepherd for six years. I minded sheep. Now that I have this new job, I realize that I really prefer working with wild animals. I've got to know the Huimel over the years. I used to be a guide, but then I developed a passion for this animal and joined the project. This is an exceptional project. It's unique. In terms of longevity, there is nothing like it anywhere else in the world. The project was initiated in 2000. That means that we've been studying the Huimel here in the park for 18 years. There is still a long way to go, but thanks to this ambitious program and Daniel's tireless efforts, the world's population of Huimels now stands at 1,500, and the population in the park is increasing every year. On the other side of the forest, the high winds and scarce rainfall mean that only dry spiny shrubs will grow. On these scree-covered slopes lives a strange-looking animal, the viscacha. This large rodent cousin of the chinchilla divides its time between snacking and sunbathing. But in nature, danger is never far away. On the cliff top opposite, an imposing silhouette has appeared. It's a black-chested buzzard eagle. With a wingspan of almost two meters, this bird of prey is the region's largest airborne predator. And it has spotted the rodent. But despite its laid back appearance, the visacha is extremely quick on its feet and hard to catch. Confident that her shelter is secure, this mother can quietly carry on with her day. she spends preening herself and tending to her young. The buzzards have a mouth to feed as well. Luckily, a sheep from a neighboring ranch has succumbed to the region's harsh climate and will serve as manna from heaven for this family of vultures.
Christian Saucedo travels to Puesto Choique several times a week to visit the team in charge of reintroducing rayas. He uses the opportunity to take them food and other supplies. Situated in the middle of the plain, the center is over 80 kilometers from the nearest village, and the path is almost impassable. Here, the constant wind makes working outdoors exhausting. The day is punctuated by breaks, during which they drink a traditional brew known as mate. The companionship is vital. As far as the rear is concerned, despite it being fairly widely distributed, the numbers have been decreasing. This sharp decline is the result of actions taken by humans, made all the worse by all the fences which act as impenetrable barriers. The rears that fail to cross them get cut off from the group. Reyes had almost disappeared from the region, but these years of hard work might finally pay off. In Chacabuco Valley, there are between 25 and 30 rears, which is hardly any. Such a small population is at risk of imminent extinction. Thanks to our program, we hope to see those numbers increase to perhaps 100 rears. We are about to embark on our second breeding season. It's an important moment because all the rears which have been with us for a year are going to be released into a pre-release flock. It's an interim stage before they are released into the wild. This pre-release flock will be exposed to predators, such as the puma. It's a risk, but it will allow us to see how the rears will react to predators under real conditions. Watched by the park's whole team who have gathered for the occasion, the long-awaited moment has arrived. It's a timid start to life in the wild for these young rayas. But no doubt they will find their way in this vast Patagonian landscape and contribute to the rebirth of this iconic species. As has been shown with these majestic animals, the ongoing transformation of Patagonia National Park is an almost total contrast to the general trend in our world. This is the most rapid expansion of Chile's national parkland in 50 years. Today, the parks make up over 20% of the country's surface area. Thanks to the actions of passionate men and women like Christine and Douglas, and the teams working alongside them, nature is reasserting itself and looking to the future once more. Well, my own future, I hope to be doing this until I drop dead or go gaga. So this is my life. I intend to keep going. And I doubt that it'll happen in my lifetime. But I do hope that through crisis, which is too bad, but also strength and ideas, you begin to see human societies turn this long, hard corner around greed and hubris 
and find themselves very happy and fulfilled while they live in balance with nature. It's not, it's not a big dream, it's just a difficult one. <laughs> That's it.